In recent times, better communication has allowed us to get to know the Soviet people as never before. And that's why the Superstation is presenting a revealing series entitled Portrait of the Soviet Union, a look at the heart and soul of Soviet life. When first contact was made with the Soviets to discuss Ted Turner's idea to produce a documentary series, it was never imagined that he would be awakening a sleeping giant. It was never imagined that he would be initiating the most revealing and comprehensive look ever inside the Soviet Union. This is Portrait of the Soviet Union. Roy Scheider will be your guide as you journey between the Baltic in the West to the Pacific in the East. Take this first ever opportunity to come to know a great land, a great people. Beach resorts, cowboys, rock concerts, independent business. Life in the U.S.? Nope. Life in the Soviet Union. The Superstation is proud to present Portrait of the Soviet Union. In the vastness of one of the mightiest mountain ranges in the Soviet Union, near the remote headwaters of an almost inaccessible stream, in the valley they call Karmadan, is the village of the dead. Who built it here? Its origins have been obscured by the mists of time, but we know for sure who its grisly inhabitants are today. If there's a message for the living at Karmadan, it is that the remains of the past endure tenaciously in the Caucasus Mountains. They love life with a passion here, and they cling to it for a long, long time. This man for a hundred years. Next to him, a man who lived to be 105, and Kazmet Chekovich Kulov, who basked in the sunny warmth of the Caucasus for 125 years. There's a robust human existence here, a zest for the dance of life that has endured the cataclysms of man and nature since biblical times. But can the old ways of these mountain people of the Soviet Union adapt to the rhythm of the modern age? Will they survive intact to lead them laughing and singing into the next century? The longer you're here, the more you discover how many wrong ideas you have about the Soviets. They're not a gray, colorless people at all. They don't all talk, walk, and look the same way. They all have their own identities. Just take a look at these statues in the fountain. Each one represents one of the 15 Soviet republics. From a distance, they all look the same. But up close, well, take a look. Then ask a Russian if he's different from a Georgian. Ask Georgians if they're different from Latvians. And how about the Kazakhs? And the Lithuanians? And the Estonians? And the Armenians? And the Yakutis? Their sense of identity is very dear to them. To some, as dear as life itself. Especially those who live in the Caucasus mountain region. The people who are said to live at the end of all the earth. The ancients called the Caucasus mountain lands the end of all the earth. Peaks towering over 20,000 feet turned away the hordes of Hammurabi, Alexander the Great, and Genghis Khan. In modern times, the armies of Adolf Hitler were stopped here, 
A great rampart range running for 600 miles between two seas on the Soviet Union's southern frontier, the Caucasus separate Asia from Europe, east from west, Muslim from Christian. The tides of human migration that flowed in and around this global reef of a landscape over 5,000 years have left their mark. Many peoples of different races sought and found refuge here in the high valleys of the Caucasus. When the Roman legions passed this way, it said they needed 130 different interpreters to conduct their affairs with the local people. In this part of the world, there's every likelihood that villagers here speak a different language and have different origins from folks in a neighboring valley. But they're all Soviet citizens. In the mountains, self-reliance means survival. And everyone has a role, young and old alike. For it's a hard scrabble life, this eternal tussle with nature. Summer here is very hot and the land is quite dry and infertile. But we can grow potatoes and grain for the animals. The harvest was bad this year because there wasn't enough rain. There are bears here and wolves too. And recently there have been more and more of them because of the new laws against hunting. We would like them to allow us to hunt, to protect our livestock. Concern for wildlife is an intrusion rural and farming people have been learning to live with everywhere. Hunting laws apart, today the Soviet government's hand is less heavy on these people. There's a certain respect for their traditional ways. Throughout the Caucasus, where every rugged valley is likely to have a village with an old fort and a long history, identity is very important. It's a wedding in the village of Gunib in Dagestan. As the wedding party hurries away, the villagers celebrate their good fortune in the age-old manner. Outsiders rarely come. People express themselves uniquely, simply, joyously. Traditional dancing, traditional dress, traditional music. But it's something more than mere entertainment. Family, village, clan are values that recur throughout the Caucasus. The further down the valley, the more these values are eroded by the influences of the outside world. It's important to Dagestanis that each generation is reminded of the special ties that bind them, if the torch of identity is to be passed on. The sweetness of life today in the Caucasus belies the violence of a not-too-distant past. Home and hearth are still not taken for granted. When in the time of their forebears, petty local warlords and invading armies made the Caucasus a virtual theater of war. Every man was expected to be a fighter. Every woman to keep his house. In Dagestan, old warriors never die. They simply change profession. But Dagestani women continue to cater to their menfolk at home with the niceties of a protocol born of centuries of practice. As part of the Soviet flock, the Caucasus republics today have at last come to enjoy a prolonged, and they believe, permanent period of peace. 
though around them everywhere are reminders of a turbulent past. Overlooking the village of Gunib, the walls of an ancient hilltop fortress are the vestigial remnants of one of the most incredible tales of the Caucasus. The story of a charismatic Islamic holy man known as Imam Shamil. To his Dagestani followers, Shamil was a demigod. To the Russians who fought against him, he was a monster. One of the most formidable enemies they had ever encountered. For over 30 years, Shamil conducted a hit-and-run guerrilla war with Russia from a network of mountain strongholds. During that time, he slaughtered over 15,000 Russian soldiers, always fighting in his beloved mountains. Only once did Shamil come near defeat. On that occasion, the Russians took as hostage his little eight-year-old son. For 15 years, Shamil plotted to get him back, and then came his chance. Two Georgian princesses were living in this house under the protection of the Tsar. To the acute embarrassment of the Russian army, in a daring raid, Shamil's men swept down out of the hills at dawn and abducted the princesses on horseback, complete with their children, a nanny, and a bunch of servants. For a month, the abductors wound their way up narrow gorges and over snow-capped passes to their remote mountain stronghold. The Tsar of all the Russias was not best pleased. Two royal ladies under his protection were now languishing in the captivity of a man who had had his own mother publicly whipped when she transgressed Islamic law. The final insult was a simple message from Shamil. You return my son, and I'll return your princesses. A truce was called. The Russians gave Shamil his son. The Georgian princesses were returned to their families intact. The fighting started again. The Russians attacked, and back, back, back into the hills, Shamil was driven. Finally, he made it to a fort on a cliff above the village of Gunib. Here, he and 400 men made their last stand against 40,000 Russians. The guerrillas fought like fanatics, but the odds of 100 to 1 were too much. One by one, they were wiped out until only a handful remained. One of them was Shamil. Seeing that it was no use, he surrendered. After 35 years, the Holy War of the Caucasus was over. Shamil was taken back to Moscow and treated as a celebrity. He died in Mecca, never seeing his mountain home again. The name of the Dagestani warrior who for so long thwarted the might of the Russian Empire is publicly acknowledged simply as a street name in the village of Gunib. Number 46, Shamil Street, Gunib, Dagestan. This fortress cathedral has protected Georgian Christians well over a thousand years. But their survival is, in equal measure, the result of the Georgian fighting spirit. Hammurabi, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Tamerlane, they all tried their medal here and left. Today, 2,000 years of warrior tradition is distilled in the Georgian dance. Nino Ramashvili has been the driving force behind the Georgian State Dance Company for more than 40 years. Her son, Tengis, is her second in command. But when Nino takes the floor, 
there is little to do but watch and listen. She inspects her troop with the eagle eye of a five-star general. Nothing and no one goes unnoticed. What's most important in our dances, what our dances express best, is the chivalrous attitude of our men towards our women. There's great contrast in that the dances of the men are very fiery and energetic, while the women are graceful and noble and soft. On the tip of their toes, they don't use any padding or any protection at all. The boots are as thin as gloves. This is unique to Georgian dancing. was done by my late husband Iliko. We founded the group together more than 40 years ago. Iliko left this world happy knowing that our son Tengiz will continue the tradition. And after Tengiz will come my little grandson, Ilikos. And Georgian dance will survive whether we are dead or alive, as long as the nation lives. Georgian dance is, above all, an attitude, and it's learned very young. For male dancers, Georgian dance is equal parts gymnastics, ballet, and self-torture. But any red-blooded Georgian boy would love to be accepted in this world-famous dance troupe. The main thing is to be dramatic. Georgia State dancers are both the living embodiment of their own people's culture and the most elegant ambassadors for the Soviet Union, at home and abroad. Today, they practice on a mountaintop in the Caucasus. Tomorrow, they perform in the theaters of London, Paris, and New York.
What better way to end an evening that began with the performance of the Georgia State Dance Troupe than in a Georgian restaurant? In Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, the restaurants are much like this. They're lively, full of music and dance, crowded, and uh, elegant, like the Georgians themselves. There's one main road through the Caucasus, the Georgian military highway. It takes its name from the last century when the Russian army, at the invitation of the Georgians, had to pacify the wild mountain tribes. A proper road from Russia was essential. A journey that once took a month is now a few hours by car. Every year, via the military highway, thousands of Russians march through Georgia once more, heading for the Black Sea holiday resorts. Sukhumi is an old town where they say Jason and his Argonauts came looking for the Golden Fleece. Today, Soviets from all over the Union come here to bask in its golden sunshine. This is the Caribbean of the Soviet Union. A subtropical climate with sunshine all year round, the Black Sea resorts are packed in season. And even now in October, the water is still inviting, especially when you know that the temperature back in Moscow is freezing. If you want to exercise the mind, the town's botanical gardens are a popular attraction with everyone. <laughs> And they've recently added one more piece of wonder access to the largest cave in Europe, discovered by a goat herder just a few years ago. The gods have smiled on Georgia. It's a beautiful land that benefits the whole of the Soviet Union. Georgian tea is drunk from Tbilisi to Vladivostok, and it's tea harvest time at Likni Collective Farm Number 1. The collective is over 50 years old and thriving. 2,500 members produce tobacco, grain, vegetables, and fruit to a target conceived by the central planners. Surplus production means profit in the workers' pockets. They make sure there's a surplus. To the true Georgian, there are many things more important than money, like the Georgian wines, warm and mellow and a little heady sometimes. That might also describe the Georgian culture. Georgian culture has a lot of caring and love in it. Take such a trifle, for example. When two Georgians who are not necessarily friends, but will just know each other, if they get on a bus, both of them will rush to buy, to pay the fare for both of them. And uh, they'll be very confused if one of them will pay for himself. It's a symbolic action because it doesn't really cost much. It's just a small sacrifice. But after all, the love is measured by sacrifice. And so there is a lot of love and caring in this culture. Gela Chakviani is a Soviet Georgian who's visited Georgia in the USA. He's traveled extensively around the world. He shares his cultural insights with fellow Georgians on his popular television program, The Globe. Gela believes that people today can comfortably belong to more than one culture at the same time. For him, there is no difficulty in combining the centuries-old tradition of his republic with the emerging traditions of his country, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union consists of 15 republics and many more nationalities, and all of them have the culture that is inherent in a socialist state. And we have this common Soviet culture, but on the other hand, every nation, every nationality in the Soviet Union has its own language, its own national character, and probably some cultural patterns that are unique.
To Gela Chuck Viani, there is no city on earth more cosmopolitan than his beautiful city of Tbilisi. He's proud of the robust mixture of cultures that have come from the far ends of the earth. A thriving Jewish community has lived in Tbilisi for centuries. Oh yes, definitely, they worship. There are Russian churches, and there are Georgian churches, there are Armenian church, you know, and there is a mosque. Muslims, Jews, Christians, communists, they're all part of the texture of life in Tbilisi. Christianity came to Georgia in the fourth century, long before Western Europe. Young people today seek the blessing of the church in marriage, but the official ceremony would have taken place earlier at a state registry office. The status of women in Georgian society has been considerably enhanced under Soviet law. Men and women today in Georgia have absolutely equal opportunities. So there is no social injustice in the relationships of men and women. But I prefer to see the men behave like men and women behave like men. Tbilisi, like most of the Caucasus region, has grown rapidly since World War II to over one million people. The housing shortage was acute. The high-rises began in Tbilisi in the middle of the 1950s, and they almost solved our housing problems. People have always wanted to preserve the old section of the city. Because again, it's a matter of identity. You know, you must see your roots, I believe, in order to feel that you belong to the city, because it stresses continuity. This project, the regeneration of the old town, has added a lot to upbringing of future generations, because what actually happens when people see it's cared for and it's restored, they love their town more. As a child, I remember living in small houses with the balconies, uh, and the balconies on both sides that overlook the courtyard. That sort of arrangement had some advantages for socializing the children, because a child could never feel anonymous, and all the families knew each other on a personal basis. They shared their happiness and their sorrow. You know, the triumph of one family would be the triumph of all the families in the courtyard, and so was the grief. There is a song which asks the question, where does the motherland begin? And the answer is the motherland begins in the street where you live. Family, home, identity. Tbilisi's concerns are universal, as are their deep anxieties for the fate of the world. They're expressed in the town's popular experimental theater. The play is a parable about villagers who become divided. The issue doesn't matter, but to the women folk, the violence does. ever learn to live in peace.
We can only guess what ambitions were born in this simple room in a remote village in the Caucasus. What plans were made by the simple shoemaker and his deeply religious wife. Their son, Joseph, would make something of himself. He would become a priest. Young Joseph, however, had other ambitions. As Joseph Stalin, man of steel, he rose to become one of the most powerful men in history. Heads of state came to him, including Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain, Harry Truman, President of the United States. A man from Georgia ruled the Soviet Union as a one-man show. Behind the jovial Uncle Joe public figure was Stalin, the ruthless tyrant. His methods of violence were perfected during the revolution. When Lenin died, Stalin seized power. Even his closest associates came to fear him, for his paranoia knew no bounds. When his old friend Sergo Orzhanikidze fell from favor, Stalin made him an offer he couldn't refuse. The firing squad in disgrace or suicide and a grand state funeral. In 1953, death also claimed Joseph Stalin. After 30 years of absolute rule, the Man of Steel was reduced to this. His death mask. Those eyes would no longer strike terror in the hearts of all who would disagree. Joseph Stalin and the times he stood for are not proudly remembered in the Soviet Union today. But Sergo Orjanikitsi, the man Stalin disposed of, is commemorated by a statue and a thriving town that bears his name. The great monuments to Stalin all over the Soviet Union have been pulled down. It has taken time, but slowly, timidly, Unbelievingly, people are beginning to sense a new spirit in the air. The past is gone, they hope. New generations have grown up with new ideas. Ideas that Joseph Stalin would not have agreed with. Today, Soviets seek to understand their past, but mainly, they want to get on with the future. Joseph Stalin is history. The one statue of him still standing in the Soviet Union is merely to mark his place of birth. It was here, on the Russian side of the Caucasus, that the invading armies of Adolf Hitler were stopped, a thousand miles into the heartland of the Soviet Union. Every village sent its men to war, 86,000 from this region. Half of them were killed, remembered by those who were left behind. Memory of the men who died in that fearful slaughter of World War II lives on in this touching monument, inspired by the words of a Caucasus poet, Radzul Gamzatov. I sometimes think that warriors brave who met their death in bloody fight were never buried in a grave, but rose as cranes with plumage white. Since then, unto this very day, they pass overhead and cry, is that not why we often gaze in silence as the cranes go by? The cranes represent something very special to Ludmila Gazdamov. Seven brothers from the village of Gizel were all killed in battle. One of them was her father, killed at 27, before she was born. I didn't know my father at all before he was killed. My mother was pregnant when he was drafted into the army. But now, from what the families told me, I know everything about him and his brothers. Ludmilla's father, a faded newspaper clipping, and a lot of fond family legends. And there is another legacy of war she must come to grips with daily. Ludmilla is supervisor of pensions and benefits for 5,000 local veterans, widowed mothers, war disabled and retired soldiers. 
While she daily counts the cost of war, her mother pays a different kind of price. The death of her young husband, even before their child was born, was too much for her to bear. Lyobov Gazdamov simply waits. My mother had only lived with her husband for six years. To this day, she's been waiting. Even though there was a funeral and all that, she still believes he'll come back. Ludmilla is the fulcrum of the Gazdamov family. It is her inner strength that keeps and carries them united from the tragic past to a hopeful future. She has four children in Giselle's middle school number two. Angela, Marina, Leila, and little Ravian. Her eldest daughter, Jana, a student at Orjani Kitsi University, regularly visits her grandmother after classes. In her granddaughter, Lyobov Gazdamov can see that despite the pain, her life has not been in vain. The strength of family bonds and natural acceptance of responsibility characterizes the people of the Caucasus. Providing, sharing, and caring for others holds the family together in adversity. It's unthinkable to them that it might be any other way. Like the rest, Ludmilla's husband, Nashirbeg, knows his part in a well-organized team. It's kachapuri, cheese inside, hot melted butter on top. Little Ravian wants to do his bit as well, but it's not all fun. The smell of kebabs and kachapuri in the soft Caucasian air means that the Gadsdamovs will certainly have company. And they're more than welcome, for sharing and caring in the Caucasus extends through an open door well beyond the family. Even in the midst of merriment, Ludmilla can't help but share her mother's sorrow. She suffered all her life. She's waiting in hope that he'll come back to this very day. In far off foreign land, I see the cranes in evening's dying glow. Fly quickly past in company, as once on horseback they would go. Mount Ararat, towering symbol of the ancient and embattled kingdom of Armenia. Today, Ararat is in Turkey, and Armenia is a thriving republic in the Soviet Union, south of Georgia. Yerevan, the capital city, bustles with the industry of these business-like people. Armenians have at last found stability under the Soviet wing after generations of persecution and genocide. But not before millions of Armenians had fled to the four corners of the earth. Why do so many Armenians live abroad? I think everyone knows. In 1915, the Turkish government massacred one and a half million Armenians. Half the country was seized by Turkey. And it's still in their hands today. The flame of memory of that horror burns brightly here at the Genocide Memorial, the national monument that is a sacred shrine to every Armenian. Armenia began here on Mount Ararat, where, legend has it, Noah landed the ark after the flood. Armenians claim they're directly descended from Noah. Their most sacred treasure is this fragment of wood, which they believe came from Noah's ark. Armenia had become Christian by 300 AD, a time when Rome was still a pagan city. His Holiness, the Catholicos, 
is to the Armenians what the Pope is to the Roman Catholics. He's the 130th Catholicos since St. Gregory the Illuminator. From the 4th century onwards, this place has been the seat of the Armenian Church, the only and supreme religious focal point of Armenian Christianity. Today, Holy Etchmiadzin continues to fulfill that task, particularly abroad, where Armenians need to keep their faith, need to keep their heritage, learn their language, and maintain their religious and national beliefs. Holy Etchmiadzin is a vibrant spiritual center which provides a unity to Armenians everywhere. Ancient customs that predate Christianity still prevail here, and the church participates in them. Animals are ritually sanctified with salt and their owners blessed before a sacrificial feast takes place on the church grounds. It happens on any Sunday at any church and it means someone is celebrating some good fortune or planning a journey. Car ownership in Armenia is the highest per head in the Soviet Union. The fruits of hard work and intelligence, and a national passion for the business of business. The Armenians have a spirit of enterprise like the spirit of the grape, increasingly appreciated throughout the USSR. Yerevan's markets are better stocked with a greater variety of produce than most in the country. To the three million people who live here and their three million countrymen around the world, Armenia is more than a place. It's an idea, a faith a vital spirit. As Mother Armenia watches protectively with the muscle of the Soviet Union in her arms, it's unlikely that Armenians will have to worry about their southern border for a long time to come. Georgi Gobechaya has been around for a long time. Today is his 100th birthday. You gotta stay active, Georgi says. He planted this tree when he was 53. He may outlive it. They're having a party for Georgie. Family, friends. Naturally, they'll ask him the secrets of his long life. Work hard, he says. Eat your vegetables. Don't smoke. Don't worry about things. Enjoy sports. Now, when I was a horseman... Georgie won a lot of awards as a horseman. He played this game, Chukanbura a kind of cross between lacrosse and polo. But Georgie had to quit a few years ago. Horse got too old. Old friends are starting to arrive. Welcome to the club, young fella. 
How's it feel to be a hundred? It's time for the feast and a long round of toasts to Georgi Gorbachaya for one century of wonderful life. The chances of living to a hundred are best here in the Caucasus. Everyone has their own theories. Some say it's climate, others diet, some air. The answer is nobody really knows. But scientists are studying the old folks of the Caucasus very seriously. Maybe they'll discover that the secret is nothing more than a passion for living. to life. all over the Soviet Union have the look of Far Eastern souks. Vendors, stalls that sell everything, merchants haggling with customers. A place where the rhythms of life that are thousands of years old have a chance to continue to be passed on from one generation to the next. Samarkand lie the remains of a warrior before whom all Asia once trembled. Dare not disturb my sleep, or the curse of the great Mongol warlord Tamerlane will befall the land. But the archaeologists pressed on. On June 22, 1941, Tamerlane's grave was opened. That very day, just as the Mongols had centuries before, Hitler invaded Russia. <laughs> Tamerlane still sleeps in his ancient capital. But Samarkand is now ruled from Moscow. there has been change that rivals the golden age of Samarkand. In Central Asia, the old ways have had to accommodate the new, so that this region could become a part of the modern Soviet Union. of economic achievement. 
erected here in Moscow to celebrate Soviet achievement in everything from agriculture to aerospace technology. The statue, Lenin, father of the Soviet Union, leader of the Socialist Revolution. Lenin and his planners didn't have much to celebrate after their revolution. The economy of the country was a disaster. There was a famine. Factory production was hopelessly out of date. Difficult as it was, they did pull the economy of Western Russia up by its bootstraps. But that was nothing compared to Central Asia. Life there had stopped in the 15th century. Bringing these people out of their tents, literally, and into the 20th century seemed like an almost impossible task. But it was done. Modernization on a grand scale. A great success. The people living in Soviet Central Asia today are a breed apart from those of Tamerlane's day. Yet, like their ancestral warriors of old, they still ride down the Golden Road. The Golden Road, once the highway of caravans and travelers through Central Asia. The route Marco Polo followed on his journey to China. In Marco Polo's time, these horsemen might have been Mongol warriors. Today, in modern Kyrgyzia, they're shepherds racing on a state stud farm. Up here, shepherds still live in yurts, traditional hide tents. One of them is Zagindik Zanuzakov. I'm 37 years old. Like my father before me, I'm a senior shepherd working with my wife and eldest son on the state stud farm. In the summer, we live in our yurt high in the mountains and look after the sheep. In the autumn, we go lower where the lamps are born and we look after them and live in the village. When my father was my age, we had no electricity, no television. He lived modestly. Now I have got practically everything I want. I have a house in the village, a TV, and as a reward for good work, I was able to move up the waiting list to buy a car. Life's getting to be more comfortable. In one generation, this shepherd's family has come face to face with the modern world and embraced it. And yet, they've managed to hold on to some of their traditions. The changes their children will face may be even more dramatic. Life in all five republics of Soviet Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzia, Tajikistan, and Turkmenia has leapt ahead centuries. Modernization, progress on a massive scale costing billions, and a steady stream of European Soviet immigrants has brought the 20th century to Central Asia. 60 years ago, women wore the veil. Today, it's rarely seen. With the Russians now the largest ethnic group, you'd think European and Central Asian cultures would clash that old ways would not give way to new. The infusion of European Soviets has created a multiracial society. Despite some local skirmishes, there seems to be little racial tension. Along with language and new customs, the immigrants have brought urban planning, industrialization, and the muscle necessary to move the economy along. The republics of Central Asia have generally welcomed the progress.
Alma Ata, the capital city of Kazakhstan, is a modern city that began as a Russian garrison town in the mid-1800s. The majority of its population is European. There are 78 hospitals and clinics in a city of a million and a half people. This hospital is one of the most modern and well-equipped. It serves as a model for what they hope to achieve elsewhere. Healthcare in the Soviet Union is free. Medicines, however, must be bought. In addition to the traditionally recognized medical specialties, more exotic specialties are blended in, like the Department of Mud Therapy. these space-like capsules for relaxation, complete with oxygen and a steady stream of pop music. Currently, 70% of the doctors are women. Gaisha Toksabayeva is a gynecologist. I've been practicing for 12 years now. I think the reason most doctors are women is that they want to understand more how the body works and they want to care for people. I have to plan every hour of my life. I've got no spare time because I either work or do housework. I am also the party information officer in our apartment block, as well as looking after three children. I only get to read a book between 10 and 12 when the kids are in bed. My husband and I work in the same hospital. He does his best to help me. Dr. Toksabayeva was one of the first Kazakh women to become a physician. She and her husband are pleased with the progress they've made, but they feel there is a cultural price for the progress they've been part of. At home, my husband and I sometimes speak Russian, sometimes Kazakh. Unfortunately, the children don't speak Kazakh. It's a major mistake on our part. In a few years, Gaisha's children will be entering the Pioneer Palace, an after-school activity center for Soviet youth and may be learning to speak, not Kazakh, but English. This palace is an out-of-school educational establishment. At present time, uh, there are 10,000 uh, people here at this all know. And um, at the same time, uh, there are 2,000 people uh, come here. <laughs> so, uh, there are 337 uh, various hobby groups here, so one of them is our club, International Friendship Club. Oh yes, and we, and we must send them one book. This club exchanges letters with pen pals from around the world. In our section, we learn all that you can about different countries that speak uh, that speak in uh, English. To know each other some more, not only in the letters which we received and which we sent sent to each other, but know each other and to meet with us, with them, with American people, with American youth in their country, in our country, to exchange with delegations, and so. Um, to know more and more and more. We want uh, that American youth and, uh, for example, Kazakh youth will be friendly. We want to know more about uh, their what what are what are doing what are they doing in their school, uh, how they are raised, uh, what problem they um, dis decided. Uh, so, and if, I think that American youth want. Um, to know about our work, uh, about our use. Uh, Here you can see two workers who, between them, have just finished cutting three cartloads of golden brown macaroni stalks. This last scene shows you what will happen at the end of English is the international language of business, science, aviation. 
So, for these history students perfecting their English at al Ta University, mastering it is serious and important work. But the process can be fun. Signor Fratelli, are you a servant of your stomach? Uh, we, have, uh, we have mutual understanding. I and my stomach. And oh, I, don't, uh, I don't think that I am a, uh, I am a slave of my stomach. Yes, we see. And uh, Signora Fratelli, uh, do you uh, devote all your free time to the kitchen? Yes, I'm a housewife and I devoted my, all my time, all my free time to the kitchen and to my husband. Uh, who is this girl? It is our daughter. It is our daughter. Oh, it is our daughter. daughter. Oh, my loving daughter. I hope that she, prom she promises to be a future champion. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not impossible, because my family eating only macaron five times a day, so... Poor girl! <laughs> I'm so tired, and uh, at last I hate this macaron. As small communities reach out to communicate with a wider world, so too do the Kazakhs. But at the same time, they must wonder if their own identity can survive. These children are learning Kazakh dances in Russian. We have the general Soviet system in our Kazakh Republic, but our nationality, not Russian, our nationality is Kazakh. We are the Soviet, Soviet people, people. Yes. Uh, the first time, and then we are Kazakh. I think so. But we are Kazakh. <laughs> we have all, the all, all, our, uh, all the people of our country are Soviet, but they divided into nationalities, so we are Kazakh. This is a ballroom dancing club for children of cotton factory workers. The room is the foyer of a theater a part of a huge marble leisure complex built by the factory. The quick step is a Russian one, recorded by a Russian band. These are the children of the new Soviet Central Asia, European and Central Asian alike dancing to a modern Soviet tune. of Kazakhstan are the prairies of the Soviet Union. It's a land that pioneers settled. A farming land. In the 50s, millions of people migrated or were resettled here through the government's virgin land policy. A massive attempt to open up new farmlands to feed a hungry nation. generation later, the wilderness has become a home. Mr. Soy is one of the pioneers. 27 years ago, when I came here, there was barren steppe, just lakes, birds, nothing else. And on this steppe, we built a settlement like a town, 
and 4,000 people live here now. I'm a Korean, but many people came with me, Russians, Poles, Germans, Kazakhs. We came to make this step our own. Mr. Soy's story is typical of the people who settled here, built communities and raised families. My family is a regular family. We have 11 grandchildren, and I'm sure there will be some more. The workers on the state farm look after a variety of livestock. Geese, ducks, turkeys, and chickens. The chickens produce 150 million eggs a year. We also have a thousand horses and 180 camels. It's quite far north for farming camels. We keep the camels to make shubat, fermented camel's milk. It's a very valuable product for curing people, and we use it in our clinic. Kanat Ahatov, a native Kazakh, is in his early 30s. He's been a camel herdsman since he left school. The once nomadic Kazakhs still have a close relationship with animals, especially horses. This is where Kanat may enjoy himself on a day off at the horse trials of a neighboring state stud farm. you can see a mosaic of faces, the new citizens of Kazakhstan. Russians, Germans, Ukrainians, many races, but relatively few Kazakhs. Already in the cities, the immigrants outnumber the Kazakhs, and the Russians are the largest group. In this vast land of mountains and prairies, a region twice the size of Alaska, only 15 million people live. Their land was isolated, and like the American West, it was the railroad that opened the wilderness to the settlers. The general manager of the Turkestan Siberian Railway. Railroads have an enormous importance for Kazakhstan because it's so large. It takes four days and nights to travel from west to east and two days and nights to go from north to south. In 1926, to unite Siberia with Central Asia, the Soviet government decided to build the Turkestan Siberia Railway, the Turk Sea. It took three years to build, across a thousand miles, despite great extremes of hot and cold, across country very susceptible to earthquakes and through waterless desert. The building of the Turk Sea was the first victory of the Soviet people in the industrialization of this region. Life in Kazakhstan has come far since then. I try to exercise every day. We built the sport complex ourselves this year. It has two pools and a gym. This year, we made 9 million rubles profit. 12% will be used for workers' bonuses and 12% for social projects. If everyone works well, then they receive more money. 
Not only money, but incentives. Free flats, free kindergartens, free children's trips. Today is a national holiday. Mr. Soy's community relaxes and shares a family sports day. We've got to get on with it. We need this park for our people to relax in. Let's dig this up and bring some trees to plant over here. Year by year, this pioneer community expands. We built ourselves this recreational center. You can't live without art. It's good to sing, to listen to music, and we must educate our children well. We celebrate and honor certain things here. Connaught, the camel herdsman, and his wife Borkett are one of the couples whose daughter's name will be registered today. Child registration is one of those occasions when a small community affirms its bonds. There are 19 different nationalities working here, all Soviet citizens. Throughout the Soviet Union, the birth rate is much lower among the European population than among the Asian. Connaught has 10 brothers and sisters working on this state farm. Respected parents and witness parents, we congratulate you on the birth of your wonderful baby into your family. We wish you and your child happiness and health and many happy days. The pioneers are now grandparents in Kazakhstan. October 4th, 1957, the Earth shook. Sputnik had been launched from the Baikonur Space Center in Kazakhstan. This is the Cosmos Monument, a tribute to the achievements of the Soviet cosmonauts. But it can also be said to be a tribute to the peoples of Soviet Central Asia, because the space age, as we know it, began there, in a region that only yesterday seemed to be lost in the shifting sands of time. The empire of Tamerlane has passed away, as empires do, into the sands of time and the deserts of Central Asia. But Soviet archaeologists are digging out its long history. Here, a 7th century caravanserai, an inn from the time when Arabs brought Islamic culture to the ancient cities of the oasis. An inn perhaps where Marco Polo stayed on his journey along the Silk Road to China. A bit of pottery, a crumbling wall, reveal to the archaeologist and her schoolboy helpers the threads of life long hidden. Successive dynasties, Greek, Arab, Mongol, and Persian, have all bequeathed their legacies to the great cities of Bukhara and Samarkand. Just of knowing what should not be known, we take the golden road to Samarkand. 
Such words from poets conjure images that have lured countless merchants, warriors, adventurers, and now tourists to Tamerlane's capital. Life in the bazaar has hardly changed at all in the centuries since Tamerlane. People still come to haggle over the price of a melon or some cloth and to pick up the day's news and gossip like they have for countless generations. And as it's always been, this is a private market. Food grown on private plots brings whatever price the market will bear. Behind the market rises the Bibi Khanou, the great mosque built in honor of Tamerlane's favorite wife. Legend has it, the architect dare kiss the beautiful woman and was lucky to escape with his life. Over time, his masterpiece barely escaped with its life. But now the Bibi Khanoum is being carefully restored. We restore the buildings as monuments to the craftsmen, the people who made them, real folk craftsmen. We want future generations to know about our culture and our people. In charge of preserving the beautiful buildings of Bukhara is architect Robert Almeyev. Some historical monuments in Bukhara, like the one we're in now, the Mir Arab Madrasa, were built as Islamic colleges. We are restoring it as well as three other working mosques. We are not doing it for religious reasons, but because our government is restoring all important monuments, times change. Islam is not so popular now. Islam is not allowed to hold back social development, but it flourishes still as part of the cultural identity of Uzbekistan. It's Friday in the city of Tashkent, a work day. One of the few remaining working mosques is full for prayer. The sermon is given by the Mufti, the leader of the Muslims of Soviet Central Asia. His congregation numbers many hundreds, mostly elderly. But the great buildings of today in Tashkent are no longer for the faithful. The priorities of the state are different, and women have a role to play. Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, was almost totally destroyed by an earthquake in 1966. Billions were spent to rebuild the largest city in Central Asia. The metro is the most recent example of such investment. Special engineering skills were needed to build a system in this earthquake-prone zone. It reveals the level of technical skills evident now in Central Asia, which is also the home of the Baikonur Space Center. This station, called Cosmonauts, celebrates achievement in space, including the joint Apollo-Soyuz mission. It's taken only two generations for the people of Tashkent to travel from the third world to the space age. Не пел он песни страстью обвиненный, Не плакал горько, не пускался в пляс, А гордо шел, а гордо шел. Все удивились, что с головой слоненой Пришла ко мне красавица тот час. The citizens of Tashkent share all the comforts of an industrialized state. But it's a state with problems of its own.
The Soviets imported heavy industry into Central Asia. Industrialization was the mechanism they used to transform the economy and change social attitudes. But today, many of the original plants can't cope with the increased demands for higher productivity, greater efficiency, and improved quality. In a world that is turning to high tech, the problems get more acute, but changes are starting to take place. Mirvahid Yusupov is the foreman in a mechanical assembly shop. In my section, the main policy is to install robots to free people from monotonous heavy work. Where robots are installed, there is now only one worker where there used to be four. The three who have been freed are not unemployed because the factory is expanding and it needs their skills in other areas. Seats in this computer class in the Alma Ata Center for Pioneers are precious. There are far too few computers to meet the demand. We don't hurry to other classes in the way we hurry to this one. Everyone comes to these classes. We all like these machines. We'd love to take them home to work with them. At the moment, the technology is mostly imported from Japan. The Soviets do make personal computers, but they know they're still a long way behind the demand for them. Comrade Gorbachev said that we need drastic changes in the Soviet Union. It seems to me that we can't do without this new technology, because it's helping so much in all fields of the economy. The new breed of computer races are the same the world over. The changes computers bring are the same, too. It'll be a different world these girls grow up to. In Soviet Central Asia, with its Muslim traditions, most women work, as the law requires. Equal rights for all women is written into the Soviet Constitution. The 6,000 workers and most of the managers in this cotton factory are women. For working mothers, there are kindergartens which are quite inexpensive, and most factories have them. woman, now an established part of the Soviet workforce, is also part of the new and growing consumer revolution. The newfound prosperity in Central Asia has only increased the demand for more and better products, a demand that is fueled by severe shortages of consumer goods throughout the country. And this new prosperity has revealed other shortages as well, like what do you do with your leisure time and the rubles in your pocket? Until recently, there was little to do on a Sunday in Tashkent. But traditional festivals, the likes of which have not been seen for decades, are now back on the streets. It's in the little things, the opportunity to loosen up and have a little fun, that the ordinary citizens say their lives are changing. Occasions like this show the authorities are beginning to respond to what people seem to want. The wind of change is blowing, and it's clear it comes from the people, as much as from the leaders in Moscow. The experimental mime theater in Tashkent is an amateur review. Its satirical show has a ready audience. The climate of reform is welcomed by the artists. Kirkis film director, Balat Shamshiev. The most important thing is openness. 
We have to say what we think, that black is black, white is white. Why hide it? People are fed up with having orders from above. However clever the people up top might be, they may not have recommended the right thing for local conditions. years have seen the growth of a new professional class in Central Asia. Soviet yuppies. Many interested in literature, movies, and the visual arts. These are the people who are welcoming and driving forward the reforms that Mr. Gorbachev is bringing in. Nowadays, the nearest most Central Asians get to a horse, maybe a day at the races. The stakes at the state-run track are only pennies, and the payoff is in much more. But the lines are long, even for the next race. The camels are state-owned, but the cars are increasingly private. One in seven Soviet families owns one. The Soviets have more money in their pockets than ever before, and a car gives them far greater independence. Up to a point, that is. Look familiar? But to see how far the daily grind for the ordinary man has changed, it's necessary to go where most people still live, in the countryside. The white gold of Uzbekistan is cotton. Massive irrigation schemes have made much of the desert fertile. State-run organizations farm the cotton increasingly by machine. This field shows how the economic reforms of recent years work in practice. A family's income now depends upon the amount of cotton it produces. Mohammed Razulov used to work for a fixed wage as one of 1,300 laborers on the Pyoric State Cotton Farm. Today, with two daughters, he works as a family team on one field. They've found the change much more profitable. We are Muslims, citizens of Uzbekistan. I'm not a communist myself, but my eldest son, who works in a hospital, is a member of the party. We're very happy with our lives, and we are paid well for hard work. That's good enough for us. Our family has two houses, a car, our own cattle, and our own plot of land. We only spend money on clothes or things like radios. We make enough during the season to be able to sit comfortably during the winter. A hundred years ago, Muhammad's life would not have been so comfortable. Bukhara was a city famed only for its backwardness and the cruelty of a ruler whose every whim was obeyed on penalty of imprisonment, or worse. Two British agents who were on a mission here were consigned to a pit where their flesh was eaten off by vermin and reptiles. The last ruler built himself a European-style palace and imported artists to embellish it. The palace is now a museum, and the city he ruled festooned with telephone wires. These days, the traditional mud houses in the back streets of the old quarter of Bukhara have water, electricity, gas, televisions, Yet the unconscious fabric of life changes very little here. 
Some things never change, like food. The Chai Khana, the tea house where old men meet. It hasn't changed since Tamerlane ruled Bukhara. In Soviet Central Asia, the old sit side by side with the new. Every evening after classes at the Frunzi Polytechnic in Kyrgyzia, the disco club goes into action on lemonade. All the trappings of the modern world have been brought into Central Asia by the Russians. As a consequence, much of the native culture has been sanitized, cleaned up, and displayed in the glass cases of regional museums for the benefit of foreigners. Yet even here, pleasure in their own performances can remind the musicians of their roots. Yesterday they lived in another age. Today they've been transformed and have embraced change. It's no longer the call of the muezzin that unites the faithful each night. It's the news from Moscow in Russian that's listened to around the hearths of Soviet Central Asia. Добрый вечер. Здравствуйте, товарищ. Передаем ответ Михаила Сергеевича Горбачева на вопрос организаторов шестой Софийской международной встречи писателей. Вопрос. Каким вы видите будущее планеты, человечества и цивилизации? Ответ. Вопрос, на который вы просили меня ответить, пожалуй, главный вопрос. This is the Uzbekistan restaurant, a favorite gathering place in Moscow for Central Asians. As you can see, they've certainly come into the 20th century, and they're fully prepared to play a substantial role in the development of the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте. Hello. Pretty, isn't it? You can almost hear the sounds of Renaissance music, laughter, the hoofbeats of horses on these weathered cobblestones. The Baltic states have always had a thriving culture. That's part of the European mainstream. But they've had something else, too. Flexibility. A flexibility that's allowed them to do better with socialist economic policies than any other Soviet republic. Moscow would like to harness that flexibility. They've turned the Baltic states into an economic laboratory of ideas that someday they hope will flow into the Soviet mainstream. This rock festival is not yet Soviet mainstream, 
but the ease with which rock and roll has been accepted in Lithuania is typical of the Baltic style. The Soviet fathers seem to be coming to terms with the enthusiasms of the young just as they have with the traditions of the old. The mass they celebrate is Roman Catholic. Lithuanians have much in common with neighboring Poland, with whom they were once united. Local tradition proudly claims that the city of Vilnius has more churches per citizen than Rome itself. Certainly in the shopping district of Kaunas, the young citizens of the Baltic states enjoy a lifestyle which their Russian neighbors find hard to match. The leaders in Moscow are keeping a close eye on the Baltic states to see how new ideas will work out in practice. Moscow's focus on Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia tiny spots on the vast map of the Soviet Union is giving them influence far beyond their size. The model is Tina Janssen. She was discovered by one of Tallinn's best fashion houses while working in a local hotel. Now at 27, she's one of the top models in the USSR. Tallinn, the Estonian capital, is called the Paris of the Soviet Union. The clothes Tina models are designer originals. Like in the West, very few can afford them. But they are copied and show up on the racks. So Baltic women are generally better dressed than most Soviets. Tina works here, at the studio of the Fashion House. She's also been on assignment to Moscow and abroad. She makes a good living by Soviet standards. She lives comfortably and was able to buy herself an automobile. Although it's in the shop right now, so it's the bus for Tina tonight. commute is 40 minutes from the center of the old city to her apartment in a new building in the Tallinn suburbs. She lives with her father, her younger sister, and her little son, Stan Eric. Tina has never married. There is no prejudice against single mothers in our country. There is no shame of women having a child. Women are encouraged to have children. Um, every month our society pays a little support for uh, single mothers and uh, they can put your children in a kindergarten without going on a waiting list. And our society helps them to grow up the children. It's always better to grow up uh, a child alone than be married with a bad husband. Tina has a busy life. Once a week she teaches dressmaking. There's a regular choir practice. And she dates often. The divorce rate is very high in Estonia. 
The mistake, I think, uh, is that, that people get married very young, then uh, they have children straight away, and parents have no time for each other. I would add uh, that I haven't got married because um, it's not the right time for me. <laughs> the right time will come for Tina, she says, when she meets the right man. For Ruta and Rimvedas in Lithuania, the right time has come. and groom. Today you are getting married to create a Soviet family. I'm sure you are aware of your duty to society and the Soviet state. Yes. Which surname do you choose in registering the marriage? My husband's. This wedding cake of a building used to be the town hall in Kaunas. Now it's the palace of weddings. It processes up to 40 weddings a day. You get your date two months ahead, and when they call your names, you better be ready. There's another wedding every 15 minutes. By Lithuanian custom, Friends kiss the bride at the ceremony while the parents wait at home to greet the newlyweds. We wish you all the best in your family life. There's a sense of independence in these Baltic young people. A feeling that it is they who make their lives work. It's a feeling that thrives throughout the Baltic republics. Tina Jansen is on her way to an appointment with a man who in his own way is a remarkable pioneer. Her hairdresser. Yuri Trashin's beauty salon is one of the first of the new style enterprises that Moscow was allowing to grow in the new socialist economy. And things are looking good. Yuri, his wife Natasha, and a friend Irina are business partners. They share the work, and they share the profits. There's been plenty of both. And there's another equally important benefit. They are their own bosses. They no longer work for the State Hairdressers Guild. Yuri has rapidly built up a personal following. Services like his have been a problem in the Soviet Union. But now the government is allowing, in fact encouraging, people to break away from the large state-run organizations to go into business for themselves. It's called perestroika, economic reconstruction. Yuri and his partners must figure out their own budgets, rent their equipment from the state, and work hard enough to make sure that there's some profit. It's what we call incentive. Ideas come to Tallinn in many forms, including television from Helsinki, only 50 miles away. This is Toivo Mangels, 
a government economist charged with helping to plan the future. Toivo lives in a new apartment complex with his wife and three sons. They know the West. They watch Dallas and Benny Hill and the latest current events programs. Toivo is head of labor resources at Gasplan, the huge government planning organization responsible for implementing the new bold economic reforms. They may be too bold for some of the old guard. Bureaucrats not only abstract economic reforms, but everything that's new. It's the same all over the world, including in Estonia. But as the new economic conditions are implemented, I think the uncooperative bureaucrats will be unmasked. And in the long run, they will have to cooperate. Reactionary bureaucrats got a lesson in motivation recently, when the Soviet prime minister dropped in for a quick visit to Victor's pie shop in Tallinn, a cafe that had become so attractive under the new laws that it was swamped with customers. We rent our premises, equipment, tableware and the uniforms from the state and we buy foodstuffs from them. We add all that up and what's left in our fund for wages is divided among the workers. Twenty-three people used to work here before. They used to make 14,000 rubles a month. We've cut down on staff and with 16 people, we now make 24 to 25,000 rubles. The difference in rubles is obvious. When someone opens a cafe, he sticks his neck out. Until now, we have lived in a secure world with guaranteed minimum pay. Even if people were idlers, the state still looked after them. Now we have got a new situation. What's good for a restaurant is also good for a taxi business. The express taxi firm employs anyone with their own car who wants to earn some extra money. It's good for the drivers, and it's good for their customers. One purpose of the new laws is to legitimize businesses already operating on the black market. Toivo Mangals is looking for a part he needs for his car, and he knows he'll find it here. A car repair shop that's been legal for only a few months has been in business for eight years. Some of these small businesses that suddenly find they're legitimate will also find that they now have to pay taxes. Another private venture which Toivo approves of wholeheartedly is the Video Cafe in the seaside town of Pernil. It's famous throughout the Soviet Union. Private ventures are paying off here. <laughs> Nearly a quarter of Tallinn's 800 taxis are now private, and everyone's curious about them, including Tina. Have you been driving your own taxi for long? This is my second month. And how much do you earn? Well, uh, the state wage is 168 rubles a month. But over the last two months, I've cleared 400 or 450 rubles a month. That's good. You can manage on that all right. Yes, and I'm certain that if this trend continues, in the future, state taxes will go over to the individual or cooperative system. Oh, why? Because you won't need the huge bureaucracy that's required to administer a state taxi fleet.
It's Stan Eric's third birthday, and all his friends have been invited to the children's cafe. McDonald's hasn't reached the Soviet Union yet, but it can't be long. In Estonia, there are standards of design, comfort, quality and service that are not yet found in Russia itself. When fast food restaurants do make their appearance, they'll probably try them first along the Baltic coast. Young and old seem to have a try-anything spirit here. But for the Moscow planners, the big question is, will it sell in Uzbekistan? The Baltic style is our way of characterizing the new spark of energy here. You can see it in the faces of the people, in the way they respond to perestroika, economic reconstruction, and glasnost, which means openness. You can also hear it in the words of the journalists, who are now beginning to report on the problems as well as the achievements in Soviet life. But most of all, you can feel it from the artists, who are reviving and preserving the best of Baltic literature, art, and music. this music holds over the people of Latvia goes far beyond aesthetics. Its source is the huge pipe organ, once the largest in the world, of the Dom Cathedral in Riga. The beauty of Bach's organ prelude in G major is of course what attracts people, but there's also a growing appreciation of Baltic culture at work here. It goes way back. Riga, capital of Latvia, is today a modern industrial city of one million. Once it was a fabled Baltic port ruled by knights of the Teutonic Order. Then came other rulers, Poland, Sweden, Denmark. And 250 years ago, Latvia became part of the Russian Empire. But there is a distinct German flavor to Riga, the legacy of its ancient membership in the Hanseatic League a group of old trading ports linking Germany with Russia. The language here is Latvian, and at the Latvian Writers' Club it is taken as seriously as we take the English language. Their alphabet is Roman like ours, instead of the Russian Cyrillic, and although most Baltic people can speak Russian, it's a second language. Today, writers meet with publisher to discuss which books to print this year. Today's agenda is important. There's a new Latvian grammar book and a definitive eight-volume edition on Latvian folk music. Manuscripts are chosen by merit rather than commercial considerations. Throughout the Soviet Union, writers, artists, musicians, and sculptors are held in high regard. Indulis Ranka is a sculptor with an enthusiastic following here in Latvia. His wife Mara is a potter with a thriving market for her own works. Their four children grow up in the great studio they call home. Ilsa, the eldest daughter, recognizes that one can achieve status here as an artist, and she will enter art school soon to study animation. The house Mara and Indulis built themselves in the outskirts of Riga is on land given to them by the government. Mara, because she is a mother of four, is allowed to work at home, 
and sell her pottery through a state factory. This will be the central piece in the Latvian folk song Spark in Sigulda, a sculpture representing the future. This is the top part, which I'm working on right now. The lower part is over there. The total height is 18 feet. We'll place it in the middle of Folk Songs Hill. The model isn't too good at the moment. The bottom part still has to be worked on. But the top is clearer. You can follow this line all the way through. Folk Songs Hill is in the Segulda National Park. Every piece of sculpture is inspired by a Latvian folk song, and every piece was created by Indulis Ranka. Maybe it was lucky that for centuries the German barons and clergy didn't consider Latvians as people. Latvian folklore and art was passed from generation to generation by word of mouth, and therefore couldn't be extinguished. That's why there are so many songs today, because they were a rather sacred thing. They are a rich source of inspiration to me. Art is an inspiration to most Latvians, and they celebrate it every spring with a festival. If there's such a thing as artist as hero, Gemma Skulme is one. Over the years, she's been consistently courageous in her support for younger artists, whose work might have fallen foul of the authorities. Once young artists have proved themselves to be serious and talented, they're usually able to enjoy high public esteem and a lifestyle to match. Gemma's lifestyle includes a large detached house, which she inherited from her father, who was also an artist. She's a widow, and her husband was an artist too. Her son is a popular cartoonist, and her daughter, who lives in the house with her young son, is going to art school. No. Gemma is beginning to be recognized abroad, and has recently exhibited in Washington and Pittsburgh. 
She is permitted to sell her paintings outside the USSR and keep the money in foreign currency. But the independence to paint as she feels was not the birthright of an artistic dynasty. She's had to struggle for what she's got. In Latvia, artists really have achieved freedom of expression, those that have real talent. We've had our opponents, but time has passed and we've shaken hands. We are happy that we've been understood. We've earned prestige, freedom and respect. We have been provocateurs. We have expressed the spirit of disquiet. We've been prophets and soothsayers. And we've foreseen all sorts of things we haven't liked. We've been involved in life, in issues that concern nature, ecology and social disorder. We are the ones that have exposed it all. Gemma, who once bucked the system, is now part of a more understanding establishment. Where was I? Oh, yes. Art is about life. And life is politics. All artists are politicians. The policy of glossness or openness is about the right to express your ideas and feelings more freely. It's seen as an essential part of the move to build a better Soviet society. Facing up to problems is an important part of this process. And it's starting to happen in a way that would have been inconceivable a few years ago. A young Latvian filmmaker made a documentary with a subject matter so striking that when it opened in Moscow, nearly 200,000 people came to see it in a week. The Politburo requested its own private showing. The film is Juris Podnik's Is It Easy to Be Young? There are punks and Krishnas in the film, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that young people of 16 or 17 are boiling over with energy and see nowhere to use it. Of course I had difficulties defending the film, but something has really changed in our country. I had a chance to defend the film in front of an editorial board and to prove that it was necessary to tackle these things. Thank God they allowed me to make it. Now the film has a life of its own. Then if he feels it, then he must say it by all means and nothing can stop him or... We have a dialogue, a dialogue, yeah? Dialogue. Dialogue with uh, ministry, dialogue with our uh, 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 committee of our party and uh, other uh, committees. It's not uh, new yeah? It's not an order. They gave advice this way. I mean, what do you want to And he was for it. I, as I told you before, you came, they gave some advice. They said, perhaps this could be omitted, or perhaps this there you can change it. They didn't say strictly, you must take it away, or with this you must uh, finish it. But they gave advices, and if he could stand for his idea, and he could prove it, then this was left. And I am a product of our time. Yes. I am a product too, you understand? And, the only and my sensor is in, in himself, in, in, inside. Inside, inside me. It's a very great pro it, problem for me. Yuris Podnik's film has made him a celebrity. His wife and son see him off to Moscow in a film festival in Georgia. I've been asked to make a film about drug addiction. I didn't particularly want to take this on. I felt I was being typecast as the problem man. But then my son was offered some pills at school. Thank God he didn't take them. But it made me realize that this was going on right here. 
that it's my problem as well. The school Eurus's son Davis attends, middle school number seven in Riga, is a large school by Soviet standards, with 2,000 students and a teacher ratio of 18 to 1. The headmistress believes the best teachers have always encouraged children to question. The new openness in the USSR may bring these children into contact with a greater range of ideas, both inside the school and out. Openness is not just about coming clean on social problems. It's just as important to spotlight problems in the economy. Up until now, investigative journalism has played no part. But this is changing, too. Pravda's Lithuanian correspondent, Domus Schnukas, is a force to be reckoned with. Nowadays, when the man from the most powerful newspaper in the Soviet Union visits a factory, the managers can expect trouble. This Vilnius drill plant is the third largest of its kind in the world and an important source of foreign exchange for the Soviet Union. What sort of things would you like to see the management doing in the near future? Well, I'd say the problem of space is the most urgent one. We're getting more and more machine tools, and the premises are too small. There is too much dust and noise. The power of Pravda is very great. Many colleagues of mine have helped various managers to leave their posts because of poor performance, including ministers as well. Domus walks his son home from school to the apartment, which is also his office. He reflects on the new policies which make it more difficult for bureaucrats of industry to hide their bad performance. Pravda correspondence have the right to visit any enterprise, and there is no censorship except on defense issues. The editor, of course, has his own point of view. I think this is normal throughout the world, but I can pick up the phone and complain about it. So far, on political, ideological, and economic subjects, I've been able to express my views freely. Television news reporters have not been as aggressive as the press in investigating stories, but nevertheless, today, the 9 o'clock news is the most popular program on Soviet television. Good evening. Good evening, comrades. Today, Comrade Gorbachev came to Riga. He was met at the airport by the heads of the Latvian Republic, representatives of the Latvian Communist Party Central Committee, and members of the public. Perestroika, Perestroika, what will Perestroika bring us? No? Okay, I'll just to <laughs> Mati Talvik is one of a new breed of reporters on Estonian television. His weekly reports have exposed many a bureaucrat in the full glare of studio lights. Last week he wanted to know why medicines were not more readily available. This week it's the problem of shoddy construction work. Those responsible will face Matty's questions, live. <laughs> Matty prepares the program with an on-site investigation. He interviews local officials and points his camera at the things that are wrong. This apartment building was thrown up so fast that it isn't safe. People can't live in it. The demand for new apartments is so great that this has become a hot story. A few years ago, this kind of problem would have been covered up. I think that the most important thing about the Glasnost openness campaign is not that we are allowed to speak more freely, but that the leading party organizations have now developed legal safeguards to protect the right of free speech. Formerly, secrecy was maintained by one minister phoning another until the message filtered down to the media. Then everything was hushed up. 
This has been discussed over and over again and the activities of those who have interfered with the media have been criticized. The results are beginning to show. I can tell you that the work of the media is more effective now and more open. Stop. Vilnius University celebrates History Day. Here and throughout the Baltic Republics, history goes deep. Valdas Vanilaita and his fellow archaeologist students have a rare opportunity to uncover some of its layers. The authorities are creating a pedestrian mall in the old part of Vilnius. It's a chance for Valdas and his classmates to try and find the city's medieval foundations. It's a labor of love for their city and for Lithuania, a country that had to work hard to find its place in the Soviet Union. When Lithuania joined the Soviet Union, many things worked in its favor. Most of all, it felt safe. I don't think Lithuania is oppressed because it's not a nation that is assimilated very easily. Throughout the Baltic Republics, outside influences make small inroads into the individuality and creativity of their people. Would you buy a used car from Victor Kulberg's? Well, he might buy one from you, if it was old enough and rare enough. Victor is the founder of the first vintage car club in the Soviet Union, and obviously the first here in the city of Riga. The club now owns 50 rare and beautiful automobiles and its members own another 200. Once a year, the club holds a rally so everybody can enjoy them. A wreck is not a wreck to this club. It's a new acquisition. Soon enough, it looks like this. This one, Renault, of 1927, belongs to our, one of the first club members of our club. It was founded in 1972, and this one, uh, exclusive Rolls Royce Silver Shadow of 1965 is uh, a little bit modified by traffic accident and it had been uh, one of the cars of our previous master, Mr. Brezhnev. Victor has vintage car contacts all over the world. An American millionaire collector wanted this car so badly he offered to build Victor a car museum in exchange for it. But the club wanted to keep it. So, somehow, Victor persuaded the authorities in Moscow not only to keep the car, but to finance the museum as well. So, mechanic, start the engine. <laughs> this is a superstar of our collection, the Auto Union racing car of 1938. Top speed is nearly 350 kilometers per hour because the 16-cylinder engine makes about 400, uh, 440 horsepower. It's uh, too unique to put a price here. Uh, if uh, last year the top price of all-timer had been $10 million for Bugatti Royal, then maybe more, maybe less. The car Victor proudly drives today is a Russian-made Zill armor-plated and bulletproofed. It once belonged to another Soviet master. Stalin uh, didn't draw it. Only Brezhnev and Kosygin had drawn at wheel. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's very special. It's specially built uh, as an armored car to be more se uh, most secure automobile in the world. Now you see the building uh, of our art museum. Uh, you can see that uh, the symbol of building is used, the radiator grill of uh, Rolls Royce, the best and more expensive car in the world, as a symbol of the best uh, work done by man. And uh, all the uh, project architecture of our building had been made by our Latvian architects 
people planned it especially for exposing and restoring old-timer motor, motorcycles and uh, automobiles. The Baltic republics had been a part of the Soviet Union for almost 50 years. 20 years before that, they were nations for the first and only time in their history. As independent countries, they have ceased to exist. As peoples, they are as strong as ever. Every five years, a fantastic event takes place here. One third of the people in Estonia gather for a great festival of song. It always ends the same way. My homeland, I love you with all my heart. It's a love expressed in many ways. Perhaps the most touching is that of Olaf Sohn's mapmaker. His land is but a small spot on the vastness of the Soviet Union. But in the maps he makes, Estonia is everything. I think that uh, large nations have made these maps. Uh, the little Estonian nation has not made maps. I will now uh, make a map and give the history back to a nation. This is a culture map. And I've, I've made uh, birds, fishes, navigation, architecture, all uh, together, uh, 25 is made. I think that it is necessary to make the maps for Estonian nation now. A place on the map. What a glorious thing to want. The choir sings... I do not need other lands, for in my breast lies Estonia. And in the Soviet Union today, these people can more easily sing that song. Portrait of the Soviet Union, a revealing superstation series concludes with how the Soviets are opening up to us and why it's important for us to open up to them. This important series offers you the opportunity to get to know the Soviet people. Concludes tomorrow night, 8.05 Eastern on the Superstation.